I don't Come see on. it either. It should be coming now. Welcome. Good afternoon. I am your host for today, Cedric Sanders, and I want to welcome you to the Butterfly Vision Project's Sexual Assault Survivors Talk Relationships. Today is May 2nd, 2020, and we will be discussing relationships, the good and the bad, after sexual assault uh, with a panel of extraordinary speakers and they also will be telling their stories. If you have any questions for our panelists, I ask that you drop them in the comments below and we will make time at the end for, uh, to try to answer all of your questions. So I want to uh, welcome everybody. I wanna welcome all of our panelists. And this is the prelude or the pre-show to our big event coming up on June 20th. Uh, that is Speak Up, your voice is power. That's on June twentieth, four to eight, in Concord, North Carolina. So I hope you guys can all join for that as well. So as we go ahead and get started, I want to introduce our speakers. So I'm going to start with Miss Tiffany Brown. She's a founder of Butterfly Visions Project, it's an organization that helps domestic violence victims as well as sexual assault victims. Um, she also has a uh, podcast uh, called the Speak Up and Inspire series. Uh, and that airs usually uh, every Monday, I believe. Um, so uh, definitely be on the lookout for that as well as she is an author. Uh, so you gotta check out her book, Reality Check. You can get that on Amazon Kindle right now. And you can also find out more information on her at www.tiffanylbrown.com. Our panelist after that is Miss Katrina Thomas. She is the founder of Loving Yourself, No More Abuse, Lemma. Her organization also helps victims of domestic violence and they have a youth camp that supports uh, at-risk youth and their families and educates them about leadership and empowerment. So our panelist after that is Ms. D. Hardwich. She's the founder of, I hope I'm saying this right, Minute, uh, Mon, was it Minute Moment Project? Did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm saying it right. You know, it might have a look on it. Um, it was a, a mentoring program uh, to give uh, youth a safe place to flourish and uh, reach their potential with positive role models. And uh, last but not least, panelist Nicole Williams. She is an ambassador for the Elite Dolls of Faith, a Christian ministry that focuses on helping young mothers become and maintain self sufficiency through referrals, mentoring, and community partnerships. So I'd like to welcome all of our panelists today. How you doing, ladies? Hi. Hi. Hello. Okay, so uh, to open up, we're gonna start with the fact that this is, uh, well, I guess April was Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, but let's define sexual assault. Now, um, according to Rain, sexual assault refers to sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the victim. Some forms of sexual assault include attempted rape, fondling or unwanted sexual touching, forcing a victim to perform sexual acts, such as oral sex or uh, penetrating the preparatory on um, his body, uh, penetration of the victim's body, uh, which is also known as rape. Uh, hold on, I lost my spot here. According to findlaw.com, sexual assault generally uh, refers to any crime in which uh, the offender subjects the victim to sexual touching that is unwanted and offensive. 
these crimes can range from sexual groping or assault battery to attempted rape. Um, it is important that everyone knows the definition of sexual assault in their state, because uh, I think it's different in every state, if I'm not correct. So uh, as we kind of lead into here, um, each panelist is going to kind of give their, their story. So we're going to start with Ms. Tiffany Brown. How you doing? Hi, how are you? <laughs> hey. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to say thank you to um, Cedric for agreeing to be the host for this for today. Um, all of us here have experience with working in the community. And so um, Cedric will be helping us today with sharing our stories and then answering some questions from everyone that is watching and also some questions that people sent to us during the week. So for me, um, I lost my virginity to rape. Um, there was two boys in the neighborhood who I did not like. I was the new girl on the block. And um, these two boys were just bullies. They bullied everybody in the neighborhood and I did not like them. Um, but I was at the age, I believe I was around 13 years old where I was able to stay home alone. And um, so I was home, I, it was a summer and the door was open. So the, the main door was open, but the screen door was closed, if that makes any sense. So this, you can, the main, well, basically the screen door was there. That was the only thing stopping anyone from coming into the house. Um, so I was downstairs in, in my home, in my family home. My parents were not home. They were both at work and um, they came into the house, um, didn't knock anything. They just walked into the house. Um, and I was downstairs. I immediately got up to see who was coming because when you came into the door, either you went upstairs or downstairs. Um, and I was downstairs. So I came to the door. I asked both of them what they were doing and why did, why did they come in my house? And we went back and forth for a couple of minutes with me asking them to leave and they refused to leave. Um, I was known for writing poetry on the bus. Again, I was a new girl. So people knew me from writing in my book on the bus on the way home in the evenings. And so they said, well, if you show me your poetry, then we will leave. So me at 13 years old, they were about 16. I was trying to get them out the house. So I had to go past them on the steps to go upstairs to my room to go get my poetry book. And I made sure that I asked them before I went up the steps, will you please leave if I show you my poetry? And they both said yes. Um, I went to my room and my book of course was right there. I believe it was on my desk or my TV stand or something. And um, one of them followed me into my room, which made me uncomfortable. And I, so I asked him to leave and I would come downstairs back to the door. And um, he wouldn't, he would not leave the room. And I tried to get past him and he wouldn't let me go past him. So at this point, I remember being frustrated. I was more frustrated and mad than anything because again, these are boys that I didn't like. And so I asked them again to leave and they wouldn't leave. So I tried to get around them and he did let me go past him, but the other one was standing at the end of the hallway. So my room was the last room. I mean, yes, the last room at the end of the hallway upstairs. And he let me past him. Um, when I went to go past the second one who was standing right by the kitchen where the phone was, which is what I was going for at this point, um, they both blocked me. And I started yelling at them, asking them to leave and neither one of them would leave. So I started crying. I remember crying and they both laughed at me and I started yelling at them again, please get out of my house. And I said to them, my parents are gonna be home soon. Well, being that one of them was my direct neighbor behind me, he knew that once my parents left, they usually didn't get home until late in the evening. And so they didn't believe me and they were right not to believe me because they were not on their way home. But I was saying anything I could to get them out of the house. Um, when I tried to get past the second one, he pushed me back. And when he pushed me back, 
I tripped over something that was in the hallway. I can't remember what it was. And I fell. And so the one that was had already gone to my room and the one that was standing at the kitchen, both of them took one my arms and one by my legs mm -hmm. and dragged me back to my bedroom. And when I got to my bedroom, I hit one of them. I started hitting him, telling him to leave. And when he pushed me back, my head hit the windshield. Well, the wind, uh, I don't know what is that? Like the, the shelf that's right there at the, at the window in the bedroom, my head hit that and I blacked out. Um, I don't remember what happened as far as when he raped me, but when I got my senses back, I was bleeding between my legs. Um, they had left or they ran out the house or was gone or whatever. I don't know, cause I don't remember that part, but I was bleeding between my legs. And um, I remember going to the bathroom thinking that maybe I was on my cycle, but it was not time for me to be on my cycle. And I called a friend, my best friend at the time. And I told her what happened. And she told me, you know, asked me how I felt. I told her that I was sore between my legs. And she told me that it sounded as if they had had sex with me. Um, I was 13 years old. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. The first thing I was worried about was my parents not, you know, coming home. And this had happened. I didn't know what to do. Um, at the time, you know, my parents didn't talk to me about sex. So I really didn't understand. I didn't know what to do um, because I don't remember the actual penetration. I do remember him getting on top of me, but everything kind of went blurry after that. Um, but I did know that something happened because I was very sore and the blood was between my legs. Um, I made my, my best friend, uh, uh, I made her promise that she wouldn't tell anybody. And she didn't for a few months. And she went to the counselor because at that point, I just kind of withdrew from everybody. But my parents didn't notice that something had happened because I was very adamant about not telling them. I was afraid I was going to get in trouble for you know them being in the house, even though I didn't want them there. So um, that was how I lost my virginity. I lost my virginity to rape at age 13 to two boys. And uh, it, it really set the precedent for the rest of my life. Um, I've been a victim of sexual assault more than that. Um, but that was probably what set the stage for how I felt about boys and men and, and sex at that point. Oof, that's, um, that's a lot and that's tough to go through at such a young age, I'm sure. Um, now we're talking about, I don't wanna give your age away, but we're talking about some 15 years ago. Um, so my first question is, you know, as a young teenager, were you dating anybody at the time that this happened? No, I wasn't. Cause again, I was 13 years old. I was just going into, I might've been 12. I was, I was young. Um, I was going into high school. So this was the summer before high school. So no, I didn't have a boyfriend. Um, I don't recall, you know, having a boy that I liked at the time. Yeah, I no, I wasn't into boys at the time. No. <laughs> okay. So did it change your opinion about boys and dating in general um, after that? Um. Yeah, I, it did. Um. I remember when I told my parents. Um. Well, let me back up. After that, the boys, I guess maybe they thought maybe I would tell someone or something. They went and told their boys, their friends, that I gave it up to both of them, which is, of course, not what happened. So I'm the new girl on the block and going to a new school starting ninth grade. And by the time I started ninth grade, people already knew who I was and was calling me a hoe because these boys went and told that I gave it up to both of them. 
So it was, I already had a reputation going into high school that I didn't deserve. And so I think because I had to deal with a reputation that I did not earn um, and that the lies that they started with me going into school. And remember, I didn't tell anybody. I told my best friend and that's it. So when she started hearing the rumors, she was like, you really need to speak up. You need to do something, so forth and so on. And I was in, embarrassed. Um, of course, I had boys coming at me left and right because now they're thinking I'm, I'm the new hoe in the school. <laughs> and so it was a really trying time for me in high school um, dealing, especially with boys. Um, but there was one particular boy who, um, you know, of course, I'm still a girl. I still like boys, but I only, I knew at that point that, you know, boys just wanted sex for me. And that's just the way I saw boys um, in high school until I met somebody that was really special um, that showed me that guy, not all guys just want sex. Now, how <laughs> long was it after the incident um, when you met, well, I guess when you met this guy? Um, I met him when I was 15. So it was about two, two and a half years later. I was going on 16 years old um, when I met him. So I was dealing with a lot for about two years um, being in school. But during those two years, the rumor of me being a hoe got back to my parents. And so my parents started you know, questioning what I was doing and so forth. And even if I, me telling them that I was not what they were hearing um, because they heard it from someone's mom who heard it from their child, they didn't believe me at first. And so um, it took for one night for my parents and I to be watching a movie where a girl was being raped that I finally told them what happened. And so I was, I was dealing with a lot between 12, 13 years old, all the way up to 15 of holding this all in, you know, getting a reputation I didn't deserve, dealing with my parents. So um, not believing me at first. So there was a lot going on with me during those years before I met him. Okay. So the parents found out before you met him. Yes. So did that make it hard to be able to transition into dating with this in this particular guy because of what had already happened and because of how your family um, was dealing with it did it make it hard to to be able to kind of initiate that process of dating with this guy yeah well I mean well once I told my my parents my father went to the boy's house um, I did not tell them the name of the boy that lived directly beside me because my father and him my father knew, of course, their parents because they lived right there. And so I was scared that my father was going to do something to the boy that lived behind us. And the boy, the boy that lived behind us was not the one that actually had sex with me. It was the other one that had followed me to the room. Um, so from my father going to the boy's house, I never saw that boy again. He disappeared. I don't know where his parents sent him. I don't know what happened. I didn't go. My mom didn't go. I don't even think my mom, you know what? I never asked my mom if she knows what happened that night when my dad went over there. Um, but I never saw that boy again. So they were very protective of me, but they had already heard these rumors. So for me, it made me not trust being able to talk to my parents because I was telling them the truth and they didn't believe me. Um, they didn't believe that I was not what the reputation was. They did believe me that I was raped because my father did something about it, but they didn't believe some of the things that they were hearing weren't true, which caused me to really lash out. Um, so even though I had my parents that, that supported me, they, it, it was really it was really hard to kind of sift through what was real and what was was not at that age and so um when i met this young man who finally didn't want me for sex then it, it took a lot for me to trust him and even more to to build something with him because i i didn't trust I didn't trust any boys. <laughs> I didn't trust any man either at that point. 
Got you. Um, I want to get more into that, but bef before we really get into that, I wanted to to kind of ask on one particular thing that uh, that happened with your incident. Um, as far as the the two individuals, the one that was the neighbor, um, with him knowing y'all schedule, the way your family worked and stuff like that, did you feel like you were targeted by him? I, I feel that the mix of me making it very clear that I didn't like them and then them also knowing my family schedule, yes, I, I do believe so. Um, during the whole us arguing and me telling them to leave and so forth and so on, the one that lived behind me admitted that he had been watching me through my window. His bedroom was right behind my room. So the, their, the side of their house faced our backyard. So not knowing, just being in my room and being young and naive, didn't know that he had been watching me in my room. He did admit that before, before I was raped. So yeah, I, I, think, I think I definitely was targeted by them. Definitely. Okay. Um, well, now let's kind of fast forward into this new relationship with this individual that kind of set a tone for your life. Um, how long did it take for you guys to, well, for you to be intimate with him? And, and I don't necessarily mean sex, uh, just intimate in general, you know, how long did it take and, um, and how did you guys feel about it? Um, I was going on 16 when I met him and he was 18, 19. Um, he was very protective of me. Um, when he met me, I was actually in foster care from some things that were happening in my family. So when he met me, I was just I was in a situation, there was a family dynamics that were going on that I was in foster care actually. So he was very protective of me. When I told him what happened to me, he was even, that's when he became protective. Um, there were boys that would call me names and so forth and so on. And he would fight for me on my behalf and would tell people, you know, that's not how she is. That's not, you know, so forth and so on. Um, he really defended me a lot. And I think that's the way he gained my trust um, because he believed me. I didn't have to convince him. I told him he believed me. And from there, he just kind of became my protector. And throughout my probably next 20, 25 years of my life. So. Um, so like I said, we're going to kind of forward a little bit. So how long did you uh, date this particular individual for? I actually dated him um, for a couple of years. My parents accepted him. He was the first boy that I could go to his family's house. He was the first boy that I was able to go places with and my parents knew about it. <laughs> um, I really, at that age, before I met him, I, uh, I needed to feel in control of myself outside of the rumors and so forth and so on. So I actually was with sexually with someone else because I wanted to have, I wanted to have that first time on my terms. So that was important to me, even at a young age that I was able to have sex on my own terms, even at 15 years old. After being raped and being called a hoe and so forth and so on, people not believing me, going through all the stuff I was going through, you know, my parents not believing me and then believing me, um, I started, I, I'm going to be very honest, I was promiscuous as a, as a teen because I needed to have sex on what, what I needed was to meet, for me to have consensual sex on my terms. And so, you know, you hear sometimes when people have been raped, either they do one or two things. They, they can either, at a young age for teens, this has been shown in research, either you become promiscuous because now you have to take charge of that part of you or you withdraw. Me, I became promiscuous because 
I needed to have sex on my terms. So forwarding back to him, you know, meeting him was something totally, totally different for me. He respected me, he cared for me, he defended me. And um, so he really set the precedent for what I deserved versus what I had put in my head that I was only good for. So after him, did you find it hard to be able to trust um, men in general? Um, and uh, whenever you would meet somebody or you know decide to be with somebody, did you uh, kind of forward with everything that's happened in the past or did you just kind of keep that to yourself? No, um, I always was very open about um, what happened to me. Um, this, my first real boyfriend who I'm, you know, saying is the special person, um, he remained in my life. We broke up for a couple of years. We got back together and he actually was my first husband. Um, he, uh, but I didn't feel that I deserved his love. Um, so I did things that hurt him, like cheated on him and you know, withdrew from him a lot, you know, wouldn't talk to him for days and so forth and so on, because I didn't feel that I deserved his love. And that's something that I, I dealt with for years. I mean, honestly, up until probably 10 years ago. So for about 20 years of my life, I just didn't feel like I deserved to be loved. Um, I felt dirty. I felt painted. I felt all kinds of things and so it was it's always been a struggle for me even now for me to um, open myself up to people in an intimate way um well not so much now but if you were to ask me this question 10 years ago I was still having problems with trusting people trusting men being intimate things had to be on my terms when it came to sex um just being a very dominant person when it came to relationships and sex because I needed to feel in control. All right. Well, um, before we move on to the next panelist, um, just uh, like I said, anybody have any questions, just drop them in the comments below and we'll try to get back to those. But before we move on, I would like to ask uh, any of our panelists, do you guys have any questions for Miss Tiffany? We are there? Yeah, we're there. We're, we're okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. You, you know, when that happened, how, how, do, how did you really feel about your parents going forward with um, them not really being there or believing it, um, how how did you take? How did that? How did that? How did you release that? I mean, how did it affect you in the long run with your parents, your relationship? Did it change? Yeah, um, I again, my parents never talked to me about sex before this. Um, and then when they did start talking to me about sex, it was because of rumors that got back to them. So it was really hard for me to trust my parents when it came to intimate things um, growing up. And honestly, after my father went to the house, we never talked about it again. So it was like, it was kind of, we didn't, he took care of it and that was the end of it. We didn't talk about it anymore. So, um, those kind of conversations were very uneasy for me. So I always turned to other people when I needed comfort around what had happened to me. I really didn't go to my parents about it. And that, that definitely affected our relationship, you know, just growing up as a teenager until I moved out of their house. It was, it was not, it probably wasn't the best um, relationship after that because I didn't feel supported even though they believed what happened and did something about it, the rumors and the way they treat, they acted towards me over rumors that weren't true, that really affected our relationship as, you know, them being my parents. And I, so I turned to other people 
I really didn't go to my parents about intimate things, especially when it came to boys and sex and stuff like that. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Nicole, Dee Dee? No, I don't have any questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. <laughs> All right. Well, we will go ahead and move on to our next panelist, Miss Katrina Thomas. How you doing? I'm blessed. All right. Uh, so why don't you uh, go ahead and start and share your story with us? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, mine's was uh, basically around family. Uh, members and uh, my auntie raised me, which was Corinne Brazel, and uh, the person used to come to the house all the time. Um, they would play cards every weekend and, you know, do the typical things that old school parents like our grandma and them would do. They would play cards and drink and, you know, things of that sort. I would be in the house and I'm just a teenager. I was about 15 and uh, I would be doing whatever I'm doing, but I would still interact with them, you know, because I looked at these other men and women as um, role models uh, and as family. So a guy that was close to one of my mom's friend and also a friend of my auntie. Again, I want you guys to understand my auntie raised me. That's why I'm saying mom. Um, he would come over every weekend. And um, all of a sudden, you know, little things would start happening. But, you know, me, I'm a teenager. I wasn't really paying no attention. I looked at him. I looked up to him, but he would start saying things to me that was inappropriate to say to a teenager. You know, uh, it might be something that I wore. And I never was the one that dressed prerogative in front of my mom's company because I wasn't raised like that. But he would still say like things that was not supposed to be said from him. And I would look at him and say, well, you know, you're like a, a uncle or like a brother. I, I'm looking at them, them type of roles at you. Why are you saying that? And um, he would say stuff about my butt. He would say stuff about my shape. Um, he would also say, oh, I wish I could, you know, just things that was not nice and that wasn't right to come for him. And me, I would just, you know, instead of bringing it to the attention of my mom, I wouldn't say anything. I would just laugh it off and say, you know, you, you don't say that to me. You know, I don't feel comfortable with you saying that. Times I would be up in the kitchen, like if I'm making a sandwich or making something to eat, he would stand up and stand behind me and I would brush him off and say, you know, don't do that. You know, that's not what you're supposed to do. Don't, you know, come on. And I would say, I'm gonna tell my auntie. And he would say, oh, you're not gonna tell your auntie that because your auntie wouldn't even believe you. Uh, she would say that, uh-uh, that's not true. And don't say that, Katrina. So my thing was, I basically tried to push it off, but then it would go further and further each time. So there came times when he would come over again another weekend. We're eating and they didn't cook out because they were grilled too and all of that stuff. And I would come in the kitchen and make my plate and he would still say stuff to me. He would be like, you know, you're sexy today. You're looking good today. Girl, I like how you're looking in them jeans or I like how you're looking in, uh, in those pants. I mean, just anything that I had on, he would make some kind of sexual remark. So I felt uncomfortable with that. I did take a moment one time to try to tell my auntie, but she didn't believe me. She uh, she would brush it off and say, Trina, you're making too much of it. He's probably just playing or joking around with you. Well, I didn't feel like it was joking. And then I felt uncomfortable when he would come around. And I would stop trying to come out when he was there and wait till he leave. But we also had a lower part to the house where it was a basement. And I would go down there sometime and say, just let me just go down there and I'll go play with stuff down there or just do my work downstairs. One day he persisted to come downstairs and um, he just would say, you know, oh, you're all down here by yourself and you could lock that door because when you go down them steps, you could close that door. So one day he came down there and he just stopped me and literally kind of pushed me in this little space. And he was like, okay, well, let me back up. Let me back up because this is, this is something else that um, happened. Before that, he took me to the store one day so let me go back to that he took me to the store I rode with him because I trust this man I don't think he's gonna do anything I, I brushed it off like I said to make it like it wasn't anything and like my mom said maybe I was just 
thinking too far ahead and thinking he was doing something. So I gave him the benefit of the doubt. We went to the store and he actually told me to get in the car. I got in the car ride and I'm just talking. We're listening to music. I'm like, okay. But he turned down a different street and it was dark down that street. In, in Long Island, New York, there were some streets that lights wasn't even on. So the street lights wasn't on. He pulled over and I was like, why are you pulling over over here? And he said, I want you to get in the back seat. And I was like, why would I get in the back seat? I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, you're going to do it. And I said, but I don't want to. So he kind of grabbed my wrist and said, you're going to do it. So I went and got in the back seat. But at that moment, I already felt uneasy and I already knew something was going to go down that I did not want to go down. He proceeded to get out of the car and come around to the back of the car and get in the back seat. And I said, okay. I said, I started praying. I started holding my hands and I was kind of shaking and saying, God, no, nah, to myself, this is not, this is not what I think is going to go down. He started talking to me. He said, you know, I like you and you know, I've been looking at you for a long time and I have said things to you and you, you always say, don't say that to me. And I said, yes, because I look at you like an uncle towards like a, you know, someone that's like a family member. I said, so why are you getting in the back seat? I said, please. Please, I, I, I don't I just want to go home. I begged him to take me back home. He would not take me back home. And I said, okay. I sat there and as I sat there, he moved over closer to me. And as he moved over closer to me in the car, he started touching on me. And I said, please, please don't, don't touch me. And I had on some some pants and he started to go underneath my shirt from the back, rubbing my back. And I was like, why are you doing this? I said, please don't do this. I said, I, I'm, I'm not even sexual active now. And I said, I, I'm not ready for this. And I said, and I look at you as family. I just kept pleading and begging with him not to do it. And the more I begged, the more he started touching on me. Then he worked his way to the front of my shirt, going up towards my breast area to touch on me. And then he started to put his hands down my pants and to fondle me. And I was like, please stop. I started crying. I said, God, please. I said, please don't do this. And as I said that, he literally kind of moved over some and slid me down in the seat. As he slid me down in the seat, he proceeded to take down my pants. And I started screaming and crying. And I said, someone help me, help me. And no, of course I'm on a road, but nobody don't even know what's going on. Nobody's not even driving past. And I'm screaming and I'm, I'm just like, no, please don't do this. He started putting his hands over my mouth saying, shut up, shut up. And I said, I, I'm gonna tell my mother. And he was like, if you tell your mother, I'm gonna tell her that you came on to me. And for weeks and weeks as I were coming over there for the weekend, you were coming on to me. I said, she's not gonna believe that because I'm not even that type of person. She didn't raise me that way. He said, well, she'll believe me once I tell her. So I forgot, I, I, don't, I can't get away from him. I started kicking him. He was holding my legs down. He spread my legs over. He proceeded to take my pants off and um, into me. And uh, he had sex with me. I'm screaming a whole while. Again, I haven't had sex. So this is hurting me. I, I feel sore. I feel like my whole world just changed in amount of minutes. And there was nothing I could do about it. I'm sorry, you guys. It kind of touches me. Gonna go back to it, but uh, it's okay. Take your time. Again, uh, again, it uh, it continued, it continued, and continued. So when he was done, he said, "Get up," and I said, "Okay." I wanted to be. I didn't want to do anything to get him more angry because maybe he would get back on me or would do something else. He sat there and he sat me up. I proceeded to pull up my pants and uh, I said, "You know what?" I said, I'm not going to tell anybody because I don't want you to do this to me anymore. I said, and he said, you're going to be mine from here on. I said, what do you mean to be your mine? Be yours. He was like, you're going to be mine because anytime that I see you, you will do as I tell you to do. I said, I don't want to do that. I said, I don't want to do that. And I said, I don't feel comfortable doing this, which I said, this wasn't even right. And I said, you had no right to even do this. I said, I, I'm not, I'm not your girlfriend. I don't want to be your girlfriend. He said, if you go back and you tell your mom anything, you just remember what I said to you, Katrina, that you 
are the one who started this. You came on to me. You were making moves on me. And I said, no. I said, no, I've never made any moves on you. I said, I have always been taught that when my mom had company and it was adult, I can come and get my food, go back and eat it in my room and I don't have to be bothered with anybody. I said, you were the one making accusations and saying things to me sexual. He was like, yeah, but who's going to believe you? So we proceeded to go back to the house. I got back in the front seat because he told me to get back in the front front seat. He told me to get my face together. I wiped my tears. I try to catch my composure and not um, be upset and not to look any type of way when I went there because he didn't want me to look like anything happened. So I did that. And I went back in the house. And he, before I went all the way in the house, he said, you better remember what I said to you. And I said, okay. I said, okay. Okay. And he kind of pushed me through the door. And I went through the door. And my mom said, wow, y'all were gone a long time to the store. And I said, yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, mom. She said, is everything okay? I said, yes, everything's fine. So I proceeded to the bathroom and I went in there in the bathroom. And I remember going in the bathroom, just crying and crying and crying, washing my face and saying, my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe he did this. And what you guys need to understand, it didn't even stop there because he continued to come over for cookouts and playing cards at my mom's house with my uncle and my auntie. And uh, that room that I talked about, that I started to talk about first, continued to be the place that he would continually, continue to bother me sexually. And uh, how he did it is, is remarkable. I, I, I can't even remember everything because I try not to remember everything, to be honest. Uh, but I would go downstairs and try to stay away from him because at this moment now I'm very scared and I'm very timid around this man. So I would try to go downstairs and go down there to do work and to try to isolate myself from anybody that was over there on the weekends. And he found that space to be a space where he could come and do more. And he would sexually assault me again. So this happened for a while. And leading up to that, these things going on made me just be a person who I closed down. I shut down to everybody, even my auntie, my uncle. I just was a woman who was very fearful of men. And that's how it ended. And I left it there. I never spoke of it anymore. I never tried to bring it back to my auntie's attention because that was one of her best friends. And I just didn't feel like anybody would believe me. And I believed what he told me that he would tell everybody I came on to him. And that's how this happened. Wow, that now for you, again, uh, with Tiffany, this was at a pretty young age. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, I kind of, I guess, again, with you, how long was it before you were able to date, I guess you can say, after that incident? Wow. It really took a long time because my trust was so broken in anybody. Um, it probably was way when I was in my late. Well, I'm not going to say I dated in my teens, but what I could say is that I became a woman who was just about giving her body. I didn't care. I used my body to get whatever I could get from anybody, from clothes to anything. It was, it was all about getting what I wanted. So I used my body to do that. And I would say that started from like 17 and on. Um, so do you remember the first person that you dated since, like actually dated since that incident? The first person that I dated probably was when I was about, yeah, I was probably like 17. I was 17, 18. Uh, I can't recall exact age, but 17 or 18. And that first person that I dated, you know, I was always known for the girl who was, uh, she's nice looking, she has nice hair, she dresses nice. And we know that she didn't, she wasn't raised by her mom. This is her auntie and uncle who's raising her in Long Island. People kind of knew my story, okay, before any of this. And I think people, when I dated this guy, I felt like he cared about me. 
and I could open up a little bit. I didn't open up all the way, but I did tell him some things and I told him a little bit about that incident and it, and it was kind of like he cared and he showed like, wow, Trina, I can't believe that happened to you. And you know, I would never do you like that. So I opened up to him like that, but I still couldn't trust him. I, I cared about him, but understand that situation made me where I could not really love anybody. I could tolerate somebody and I could deal with them, but I couldn't love them. So I kind of tolerated him and I went along with the program, but I never loved him. So were you able to be intimate with him? I did because I, I did become intimate with him and he was the first person I was intimate with because the thing was is that I had this perspective in my mind that sex was how I was gonna get whatever I want from a man. So I did have sex with him. Well, I mean, but not, you know, not necessarily about sex, just okay. general, you know. Yeah, even kissing, mm -hmm. um, anything intimate. Yes, I did. I did that with him, but I still would feel away, but I would push them feelings to the back of my mind and just, you know, I let it go for what it was. I mean, again, like you said, any intimacy, kissing, yes, I did that. I felt comfortable with him, but I would just put all of that behind. But that vision of things with that person still carried on with me. And you said that carried on with you for a good little bit of time, right? A good, a good while, yes. Now, um, you know, I don't want to keep harping on the story itself, but um, did your aunt ever find out? Yes, yes, yeah, she did because. The person, um, the lady, Miss Octavia, who was our best friend, um, I actually found a way to come to her and tell her. And she couldn't believe, she didn't believe. Oh my God, she didn't believe me. And I was like, well, I would never lie to you because this person was like her caretaker almost. He lived with her and he took care of her and did things for her. So she didn't believe me. And I said, well, Miss Octavia, if you don't believe me, I said, I need to tell my mom. So I finally broke down and I told my auntie. and. My auntie said, why didn't you say something? And I said, I did give you hints many times yeah. of things that he said. And you told me to brush it on the table. He was probably just joking and this and that. I said, I tried to tell you, mommy, over and over again in certain ways. And you didn't, you, you just brushed it off. So I brushed it off and I tried to rekindle that relationship by letting him back in. And then it went that far. And she said, um, she apologized. She actually broke off her friendship with that lady. And um, she kept me away from them, and she stayed away from them. So, um, and she, okay. Uh -huh. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. I know. And then she um, she asked me if I wanted to press charges, but there was things said for him that I didn't want to press charges. Okay, so how um, how is your relationship with your mom or your auntie now? You know, I mean, I know that's been up 10 years ago. But do y'all still have a, a solid relationship now? Like, how does that affect the way you feel about family now? Well, it, it was hard for me to trust a lot of family. And I still struggle with that even today. It's only certain things that I would say. But my auntie is no longer alive. Um, but up until the point that till she passed, we were very, very close. Um, I, I build back up our relationship and our trust. But as far as family, I, I tend to stand off from family even to this day. I have, I'm getting better at it. I can tell you that. I'm getting better, but I don't open up the way that I should with family. Things that happen to me or things that have gone on in my life, because like I said, this is one situation that I had this. It was actually two incidents, but I have a lot of, um, stuff that I hold, I held back from my family. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, so let's let's move forward. Uh, you're in a current relationship okay. right now, correct? Yes. Okay, so, um, and I'm pretty sure that, uh, <laughs> that who you with, um, you know, they, they see what you do with the community, with your project. Um, so, how does uh, knowing everything that's happened to you affect him and affect y'all's relationship? 
I think it has made him where times when we go through things, I may take it to another level and he'll back down and say, I'm not going to go and take it any further because I know we have triggers as sexual abuse victims. And um, I think I have explained to him and I have laid out a platform to let him know about triggers and things that can remind me of, of that situation and my other situation as well. So we tend to try to not argue and yell and or do anything forceful towards one another. And I think me telling him that he sees that's why I close down to certain things as well. I, I don't I don't open up as well to him as well. It takes a little time for me to tell all about Katrina. I have told a lot to him, but I haven't told all. Yeah, um, so I'm assuming he's pretty patient with you, you know, as far as, you know, the touchy yeah. subjects and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, he's very patient with me and he understands and he lets me go at my own pace. I don't know how I want to release it. One of the things that was said was that, you know, I, I'm not going to push you to tell me anything unless you want to tell me. So more and more, I tell more and more about my experiences, uh, about my life, about my feelings, but I have learned to open up more to him. I have. I think that's great. I think that uh, definitely helps strengthen your relationship with each other. Um, and he gives you the room to just tell him when you're ready. So there's not the pressure but the fact that you are opening it up to him more and more um, definitely helps with your relationship. And it's great to know that you have somebody after everything that's happened that's just really like holding you down and standing there with you and sticking the fight with you. I think that's really, really great. So uh, kudos to him for that. I know that's a tough thing to deal with. I know it's tough for me, you know, with my wife, you know, and it's kind of the same thing where, um, I'm finding out stuff kind of as I go. So it's not like some stuff that you talk about on the first date. Like, hey, what's your name? Hey, what's your name? What you like to eat? Oh, yeah. So tell me about, uh, have you ever been raped before? You know, it doesn't just flow like that. So, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, it's a learning curve for me as well with my wife. And I, I just, you know, kind of learning as I go. I mean, I think we were, I can't tell you how long we were together before I actually found out about um, her incident. And, you know, she was, we was at an event and she was, I mean, this, I think this was the event I met you at actually mm -hmm. um, with mm -hmm. the Miss uh, Irish Benton. And I'm in the back of the room, like, uh, so this happened. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, again, you know, it's, it's right. you know, it was a shock to me, but I'm definitely, you know, whatever I can do to be a support, you know, so I know what it's like being that person. And it's just, sometimes all you can do is just hug them. You know, I, I think, you know, after that, with, with that, um, that event with my wife and, and she told her story, I really didn't have nothing to say. I just, I just wanted to hug her. You know, and then it's like, exactly. other than that, it's like now I'm like, I don't you know, because the triggers is a really big thing or whatever. And, and I've been learning that over this past couple of years, too, with the figures. So it's like, I don't want to be invading the personal space or whatever, because I don't know how that might make her feel, you know, and I'm a hugger. So it's like, you know, I got to understand that some people that's that's pushing the that's pushing it a little bit. So, um, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. I know that's tough to have to kind of rehash that out. Um, so uh, to the rest of our panelists, do you guys have any questions for Ms. Katrina? I, I don't, I don't really don't have any questions. I guess for me is just like for me, I stated that it was very important that the first person that I actually loved and didn't feel was there to just have sex with me. It was important for, for him to believe me. Um, I needed that. It was important for him to support me and to protect me. Those were the things, those are the things that I need when I'm in a relationship or interested in someone or dating someone seriously is that you believe me. That's the most important part for me. 
So for you in relationships, what is it that you need in a relationship from someone once you tell your story? I need them to believe me. I need them to understand that that situation is why I kind of walk on eggshells with a man and why I, I have to make sure that it doesn't happen again and that you are fully committed to me and you understand my story and know that this story is not fiction. This is reality. And the reality is that you need to understand me to be with me and you need to support me and, and know the triggers, like I said again, that comes with my whole dilemma, what I've been through. So the whole thing to me is about believing, like you said, and, and trusting and having faith that I'm over this stuff, but there still are triggers. So be trustworthy, be honest, be open for me to come to you even when I'm having a moment of where I might have fell back be there so that you can support me. That's what I need. Okay. Um, Encourage me, yeah. <laughs> Before we um, we move on to the next panelist, um, I just wanted uh, a little more clarification just for the, uh, just for the viewers watching. Um, and Tiffany, you can also add to this, but you know, you know Katrina, um, can you give you don't have to get necessarily give examples of your triggers, but can you just give an example of what some triggers might be generically um, for the people that are watching? Well, well my thing is this. I, one of my triggers is I can't be in a room full of men. I feel some type of way still about that, and I'm working on that um, with meditation and things like that that I think I talked to you and Tiffany about. I meditate a lot, and I say pray up a lot. Um, but being in a room with a lot of men, I, I don't like I don't like men to say certain things to me that's out of order. So you you have to be careful how you speak to me, um, from a tone and to I don't like a man to touch me certain ways, especially if you're not my man. <laughs> I don't like to be touched in certain ways. Uh, I have a high tolerance for that. I, I don't, I feel like there's a certain way a man should touch a woman if he's, if she's married or if she's in a relationship. So that's one of my biggest things and your tone and how you speak to me. So I, I look for a man to be respectful. I like it. Tiffany, uh, you want to add, because uh, about as far as triggers, um, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be yours in particular, but just throw out some more uh, kind of generic triggers um, for the viewers? Um, I think for me, because I feel like I need to have some sense of control when it comes to actually having sex is that um, I need for whomever I am with to understand that if I say that I don't wanna do certain things or I'm not comfortable doing certain things, then you have to be respectful that those things might not have might not happen. And if you need those things in your life, then I might not be the woman for you to be with. Um, because because I was my first experience with sex was forced. I don't want anything forced on me ever. Um, even if it's you know I've, I've spoken about this before. Even when you're married, you can still be raped by your husband. Or even when you have a boyfriend, you can still be raped by your boyfriend. So. I have certain things that I am perfectly okay doing with when it comes to sex sexual, but if I'm not, then you have to be willing to accept that and respect it. Um, I'm also the same way when it comes to boundaries. You know, sometimes I need my own space, and I don't like a lot of people in my my space um, because that's my space. So um, sometimes that can be a trigger being around in a room full of people. And if I feel closed in, then that can, that's a trigger for me. Um, outside of that, it's just really respecting my, my boundaries when it comes to sex and when it comes to, you know, everyone has the right to want things in a relationship. But if I tell you that I can't give that part of me, um, either, you, either I need to be patient or I need you to understand that that's an absolute hard stop for me or a hard no for me. So 
those those are mine just you know someone crossing my boundaries and being in my personal space I don't like to feel closed in I agree I agree fully that's very true okay, good well thank you Katrina for sharing and we will move on to our next panelist uh, which is D Hardwich. Now, am I pronouncing that right? You got to help Hard, me out. Hardwich. The W Hard Hard Okay, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Hardwich. <laughs> now, uh, how you doing, D? I'm doing good. All right. Well, won't you go ahead and uh, start us off by sharing your story with us? Well, first off, um, I'm gonna go ahead and apologize in advance. I know we're on camera, but I'm not looking at the camera. I'm actually playing Madden and that's to help me talk. Um, so I'm gonna apologize for not giving eye contact in advance. This is actually only my second time telling my story. Um, Tiffany was actually there for the first time that I told it. So I am gonna say that I don't wanna fully go into detail until we actually do the event on June 20th. So I will give a good overview though, but um, I was molested for 11 years of my life that I um, earliest age I remember is five. And I do remember ending at 16 by two of my family members that were actually brothers. I don't remember when it switched over from one brother to the other, but I do remember that when it switched, the first thought in my mind was, what did I do wrong? And even when I look back on that, it drives me crazy that I even thought like that or I still even think like that sometimes. Like, you know, I, I am such a people pleaser now because of that. And, it, and it's, crazy to me I'm still trying to figure that out but anyway sorry so like I said the earliest I remember is five years old at five um I was at my birthday party and my cousin came into my room and said he wanted to give me a gift and so of course I'm five um and I don't remember my response but I do remember the next thing is that we were in my bedroom with the door closed um I was on the bed I had a dress on um, I believe I remember the dress to be white and red. He lifted my dress and um, proceeded to give me oral sex. I actually had a family member who walked in the room and she said something to my mom. I don't remember my response when my mom talked to me, but I was five, of course. Um, I do remember, you know, several times, well, at least one of the time where I had the opportunity to speak up and I didn't speak up either. And back then, you know, I, I beat myself down so hard for it. But now I realize it's, I was just already programmed. It's like the first brother programmed me and then the second brother took advantage of my program, except for it was it was worse. The second brother, um, he tried to penetrate me. I, I just, my body wouldn't let him. My leg, my thighs would literally like clamp up so he could not get in. But it, it didn't stop him from trying. Um, and he always, I never forget it, how, how it always went. I would be laying in my bed or I'd be asleep and I would try my damnedest to pretend to be asleep. And he would come in and start rubbing on my thigh. And I would just clench my eyes tight and I hope that, you know, he would give up on his efforts. Most nights he, like, he was so persistent that I just went on and turned over. And once I turned over, he would proceed to perform oral sex on me. Then in the midst of doing the oral sex, he would try to transition into trying to penetrate me. Um, I honestly, it's I you hear I'm jumping all around, I'm jumping all around because it's still fresh to me because I honestly had not even started to address what happened to me until I got married. My wife and wanting to give her my all is actually what made me actually even bring back up what was done to me I had suppressed it so so good that I'm still remembering things now that I thought didn't happen like when I first had a talk with my mom which was just last year I talked to my mom for the first time last year and I was like yeah I, he, he never tried to penetrate me but then I was in the shower one night and, and it was like a um you call it deja vu and I just started scrubbing myself really hard and I was like and it took me back to me taking showers like that when I was younger Cause that what I would 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 happen after he tried to penetrate me. I would, you know, go get in the shower and try to scrub really hard, um, just to get it off of me. And then around about 
13, it started to slow down only because I figured out that he was so jealous that if I had somebody, quote unquote, you know, that he wouldn't bother me. So I I started trading sexual favors with like the boys in my neighborhood to say they were my boyfriend so that it would keep my cousin off of me. And I know it's like in retrospect, like, well, you know, you're still doing the same thing. But for me, it was like doing it with them was a choice. Whereas being forced to do something that I didn't want to do. And I mean, like this is just it's just crazy. Like, like just even like I said, always just thinking about it on it. And like I said, like even when I'm talking right now, I'm just trying to make sure I, I cover, you know, as much as I can. But like I said, it's 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 still coming back to me. And sometimes I even hate the way it comes back to me or how it comes back to me. Like the fact that I can even still be affected now at, at 32, almost 33 years old by something that happened so long ago. Like right, so for me right now, that my biggest focus has been how to move on. Because like I said, I suppressed it. You know, kids are very resilient. So it's easy for me as a kid to suppress it. But now as an adult, knowing all the things I know and actually like working with kids that have been through these types of things, it, it really made me turn in to myself like, hey, you, you gotta go back and work on this. Um, and for now, I mean, that's just where I'm uh, in the story. And if there, you know, questions, I can go ahead and I'll answer questions. Uh, uh, give me a second. I, I apologize, y'all. Uh, five. That's that's um. I I don't have a good the best facial expression, so I, I'm apologize. But that that's a hard one to to swallow at five. Um. Okay, um, so I don't want to, you know, I know you said that this is, you want to wait until um, the actual event to really kind of yeah, go to that. So yeah, um, I'm definitely willing, like, to answer whatever questions it is you ask. Like, yeah, for, me, yeah, yeah. This, I, I, this, yeah, for me, this is part of, this is how I'm working my therapy. This is part of me, like, being able to tell my story and answer questions. But like I said, but the fact that I am, you know, still pulling back things to work on it, I don't. It like that's why I only have bits and pieces that I could tell. But by you asking your questions, it might help jog, and I might have a better description or a little bit more that can help people understand my story. Um. Okay. Uh. So let's uh. We're gonna go back to like your teenage years. Um. So how long was it before you started dating? Um after all of that was going on so i uh, i didn't date okay I, I didn't date i actually i'm i wear as other people found you know things that other people to me for me i didn't want to date I, I did not want to date like in and even at that time i had already i was aware by that point that you know i was interested in women but still just for me period i like i was so messed up I, I, like I said, I, I would keep a, a friend around, you know, to help satisfy sexual craving. And also, you know, they double, they double, they, they satisfy the sexual craving and they also kept my cousin away from me. So that was my focus. So you don't, uh, you don't speak to the cousin anymore now, right? Um, I recently, actually, I recently started, stopped speaking to that cousin. Maybe it's probably maybe been about two years now. Because like I said, I had suppressed everything. So it was easy for me to be around them before, you know, like I said, I got with my wife and, you know, she made me want want to tell her about what happened. And so in me telling her, you know, she started bringing the story out of me. So, you know, as I brought the story back up, it became like, easy to be around them. Okay, so um, let's, let's go into uh, your relationship with your wife. So how, um, how long have y'all been together? Um, we've been together going on six years. We'll be married for five in November. Okay, congrats, congrats. Um, so how easy was it to tell her um, about what happened to you? And, then, and did you tell her 
like in the beginning when y'all first started dating or you know is this just kind of like more recent um I told her closer to the beginning of our relationship I'm not going to say right in the beginning but it definitely was closer to the beginning of the relationship and actually um part of me, what made me want to share is she shared her story with me okay yeah, so she, she can come by for two yes yeah, she is so oh. she shared her short story with me and like just the way she would share with me and you know as we talked and the way she was so willing to tell me everything and then after that just watching how she was able to move like with such confidence and you know and I was like you know maybe part of that because she's been able to work on herself and I so for me you know I wanted to do that for myself so that you know I can offer her the same some of the same things she was offering me but yeah she honestly gave me that confidence to dwell into my story so I see you know with y'all sharing each other's stories did that um kind of set the tone for uh trust in y'all's relationship um somewhat I could definitely say that because yeah it definitely like because I've only been in two relationships in my life but even in the first relationship, I told them, but I briefly told them, I never, ever went to the extent of what I did with my wife. So definitely, yeah, the trust definitely played a factor and it definitely got stronger after telling her and, you know, and not being judged or having, you know, you know what I'm saying, or not, or her not believing me. Now, how was, um, how was her, um, her first response to you sharing your story after she shared hers? Like, how does she respond? So it, it was probably my, it was probably a little bit further down the road before I did actually finally share my story. Mm. But um, I, it, it, like most people, like you see, it, it leaves you speechless. So the same thing, it was more so like facial reactions as she was talking to me. And um, for a little while after that, she, it, she didn't have anything to say. Probably didn't know what to say rather. And um, so I think maybe a week or two from there was actually when we had a conversation about what I had told her. So what about um? So what about now? How um? Well, I know you know you probably can't necessarily speak for your wife, but how do you feel now that you know you've shared that with her, um, and you know kind of in, embarking on this journey to to start speaking out? How do you feel now? I mean, I, I definitely, I feel very good about it because like I said, with opening up to her, like I, I have a, a support system because of sharing with her, I was then able to share with my mother. Um, I was also able to share with one of my siblings about what happened, whereas I even told the sibling who did it and all. Um, so I, like I said, I, I, it was definitely a good thing. And even with that, like how everybody's talking about their triggers, it's also helped me figure out my triggers, helped me figure out certain things. Like, even on this video, like, it kind of just clicked to me. Like, because when we do have relations, you know, I like to be the initiator. If I'm not the initiate, initiator, then I kind of don't want to do it. And that's one of her issues is that it's on my time. And I, before now, I never really understood that it's the fact that I wanted that control until somebody brought it up. And I was like, you know what? That's actually what it is because I did lose that control when I was younger. You know what I'm saying? I, I wanted to be on my terms. So that's one thing that I am working on with her because out of everything that, you know, she's patient with me about, like, because I have definitely have a lot of other triggers. Um, I, I try to work on that one at least, you know, letting her have some kind of control in that area but it is very hard for me. Got you. Uh, so I want to touch on the um, the therapy side of things here. You know, you said that you're playing Madden and the Madden helps, uh, like kind of like therapy to help you. Um, does your wife understand that part? Yeah, she, she does understand that. Now, at first when we used to talk, she would always get frustrated about me being playing a game on my phone and so I, I helped her understand that hey you know I do something else while I'm talking because it makes me a little more comfortable like even if it's just fiddling I have like several fidget spinners and the little gadgets that you've seen the kids with and like I said I'm playing Madden because it has the knobs on here that I can fidget with so yeah it's like I said it just helps me be more comfortable to just talk and she um, does understand that now <laughs> 
that's good. That's good. Um, back to uh, with your wife. Um, in the beginning, uh, when y'all started dating, um, was it hard to be intimate with her um, in the beginning? Most definitely. Most most definitely. I'm not. I'm not a hugger. Um, I I don't even like to be touched on my body centrally. But like I said, definitely not my thigh. Like my thigh, you, you gonna get your hand slapped. It's gonna be automatic reaction. I'm going for it. So, um, yeah, that it was definitely, definitely very hard. Cause she wanna hug me, and I would sit there like that and just wait for her to be done. Um, if I was kissing, it was only because I, I was, it was foreplay because I, you know, I wanted to have relations. Yeah, so it, it was definitely a big transition because she's very intimate, a very intimate person. Right. Okay. So, so getting into that, um, you said that you're starting to see that if you initiate that it, it means more to you, um, having that sense of control. So how does your wife respond to that? That's what I said. That's one of the, her biggest issues that she don't like to the point that sometimes, you know, it, it's, it can be a, a, a get to a point when she get frustrated when she get a little petty and, you know, I go to initiate and be like, no, nah, I done told you, you know, it, it's not what you want every time you want it. So nope, not tonight. And, and prior to now, I've never been able to explain it or put it into words. So it's like now when I get off this call, it's, hey, you know, I realize why I do X, Y, Z. And then, of course, it'll be a mood different. She'll be more patient with me when I can sit there and, and help her understand why I move this way or why I move that way. That's good. I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of in your boat um, with, uh, and I just recently shared uh, my story, my situation, and I know it's it's tough. Uh, it definitely puts me in a tough position because I'm a man, mm -hmm. and a lot of the times people think, oh, you know, this type of stuff don't happen to me, and it's always the women, it's always a man on woman situation. That's not always the case. So, um, and then in my particular situation, it was it wasn't a woman doing something to me; it was a man. And, and that, as a man, that's something really hard for me to just come out with. Um, so uh, when I just recently uh, kind of shared my story uh, on um, Tiffany Speak Up and Inspire series, uh, that was the first time me sharing uh, with the world for the most part. Um, so that was huge for me to just kind of jump out there and share that live. So. Um, I definitely understand where you're coming from with, you know, it's still kind of being fresh and being kind of hard to just kind of put all that out there. Um, so I'm not going to really, you know, harp on a lot with, with mine, but um, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. So um, I do want to thank you for sharing. I know that's kind of tough, um, but to our other panelists, do you guys have any questions for Ms. D? I only have one question because I'm pretty sure that um, some people might be thinking it that are watching. Um, Dee, do you feel that what happened to you is the reason why um, you're attracted to women versus men? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that, which is a question I actually often get, but I don't believe that at all. Um, I knew in, in fourth grade that there was something different about me but there's also and like I said I'll go more deep into detail like I think um, Nicole was talking about how she had a separate incident I, I do have a separate incident outside of the molestation it was a one-time incident but it was actually with a female cousin and it's I I, I enjoyed it like, even though, like, it was all forced, like, definitely with, with my male cousins, I, I, I never enjoyed it. I just wanted to be over. I would go out of my body. But with this female cousin, even though I was forced, I actually enjoyed what was going on, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my only question that I had. Mm -hmm. Katrina, Nicole? Hey, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Your kitty cat's trying to get into the. Into and the you should hear her behind me what she's doing. That's why I keep moving like 
all right well if y'all don't have any um again thank you misty for sharing and yes, we, will, um, we will move thank on you. to our final panelist uh, miss nicole williams how you doing I am doing great, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And first of all, I want to say I do apologize for a lot of my technical difficulties. It seems like the enemy really didn't want me to get out whatever it was I needed to say, because everybody thus far has touched on everything that I've been through. And actually, the assault that I was going to go into was actually about when I was married and not wanting to, to have this. But you all opened up wounds in me that I didn't realize, especially with D said that, you know, I have to release this and so I could be a help to somebody else. Because in other so many words, like, you know, this is my therapy, how I'm going to poetry has been my therapy all my years. But then when I hear the stories, I think about how it led up my life, like when I was six, you know, when I say that it happened over and over, I think it happened over and over. Man, young, old, woman, young, old. So it's like I've been molested and raped so many times and sexually assaulted by people that when I got older, I started questioning myself, you know. Somebody touched something and it said something that, you know, when it started, I remember that at first it was innocent, you know, staying at a, a friend's house, you know, somebody that my parents is okay with the young girl, you know, we were girls, we were kids. You don't think about these things until you get older. But as my life, I went on, I thought about it, what happened later on that conspired everything that happened at, this young girl, she, she touched me. You know, we used to, I used to sleep in the bed. You know, don't think nothing about it. She's on top of me. She's doing things. You, when you kids, you don't think it. The, the mother caught us and she started making us, you know, take hot water and bought and go in the bathroom and put it down there. And I remember sitting over the toilet and like, I'm putting hot water down there and, you know, and cleansing us and cleansing us and cleansing and cleansing us. And every time I came over there, before I came over there and we played, she made us do this. So, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think nothing about it. And then multiple times when I stayed over the house, I remember sleeping in the bed between her and her mother and wondering, you know, and, and being touched and being fondled and, and going through these stuff. And then I remember one summer staying with them at a family house, member house. And getting the Barbie doll. I remember this Barbie doll, I just love the Barbie doll. Her uncle took, you know, took us to buy these Barbie dolls and we playing with it. And he's laying on the couch and now we are playing, sitting down and he's watching the game and we're on the floor. And I remember him just messing with us. Oh, can I see your Barbie doll? But his hands was going in places that we, I didn't understand. And I remember not still thinking about it, just thinking about my Barbie doll. He said, it's okay. Oh, you know, it's just the Barbie doll, see the Barbie doll. And remember, and just, and now when I think about it, I'm wondering if this happened to her and that's why she practiced on me because he was on her. Because one time during that summer, I actually walked in and I saw him on her, you know? And it's a good question that you asked D uh, because this same young girl that I'm talking about to this day, She's with a woman. I've never seen her been with a man, you know? And um, then as this passed on, then I remember a, a boy cousin, same thing, doing this to me. And thinking this is normal. Then I'm going on and I remember, and, and this would be when I don't want it. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, it's simple, simple. You know, all these things are simple things, but they weren't simple because I remember a brother and sister being in there and doing it and not wanting to and wondering what's happening to me. So as I got older and every time it seemed like, I remember somebody else driving me to the canyon, sitting me on a lap. And this is why as I got older, when Tiffany touched bases and said, I wanted to be at my means. So when I got 14 and had sex for the first time, it wasn't even at my means. It was 
just to do it because everybody else do it to let this guy do it. Everybody else do it to me. I guess that's all I'm good for. They buy me, they do this and then and make me do it. So when I got and finally got into a relationship at a young age, that young man I was with for five, six years of my life because I felt like he was my protector, but I was young, 15, 16. And I, and I felt like that he protected me from all of these abuse, but mentally I was messed up because then I learned to be promiscuous at one point in a couple of years of my life. And that was because it was at my terms. Now I had control over my body. So whatever I did, now I could be pleasing because I did it. I learned to people say, oh, you crazy because I don't take no nothing, no man for no money. I'd rather struggle and go through what I go through because all my young life, that's all I've had was somebody sitting there trying to give me something, bribe me something. So I said, if a man doesn't give me nothing, then he can't get nothing from me. And then if he gave it, I gave it. It was on my terms. But meanwhile, it was hurting me, but I'd rather go through the struggle. I'd rather have went through that pain to, to endure that. And I kept getting hurt. But because of all of that that happened in my life, it messed me up mentally when I seen it going on from, from your family to your friends, to the church, to things that I didn't know who I was. And even at 50 years old, I still struggle with trust issues. I'm the big advocacy for everybody else because during this time that I went through stuff, when I got older, I found out my brother was molested. So I became everybody's protector because of what I went through and because of what I endured that I forgot how to take care of myself. And I don't, without me going on, and that's what led me into the marriage that I was in, into the situation and the things that I had to go through and I had to endure. I'm not even telling the full story, but of how, the rapes and the, everything that I had to endure, but it made me who I am. And it made me who I am to stand up for somebody, even though I'm still fighting within my own self with those demons of those hauntings and those struggles and that pain. But it is a therapy. The poetry is the therapy. The talking, the getting out is a therapy. And actually right now, today was the first time I even shared about what happened at, at being at six years old? Because I was always a secret person. Nobody knew this. Nobody don't understand me, but I've always also been a misunderstood person. And what people don't fail to realize is because of all of that I've been through and I had to endure in my life. Things that I don't say because I don't want to hurt the people that I love. I don't want the family members to know who did it or the friends. And so I live with that pain and I live with it. I'm sorry, and I live with it, but I'm still here, I'm still alive. And when I think about the past, it, it makes me, that's why I've been tight for watching people around my children and around my family, my, my friends. But even though those same people could be the same one that hurt you. If time's been taken when I wanted to just cry and die and kill myself, but I didn't want to because I had my brothers and my sisters and then the, or you know, and my, when I'm in my other family and my brothers that's inside to take care. So you don't know how to take care of yourself. You don't know how to be a little child. You just know how to survive and take care of everybody else. So. That's my stomach. Oh Jesus. Yeah, take take a minute. Take a minute. That's that's a lot. That is a lot. Um so, uh, talking about relationships, um, but you 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 made a point and this is something that uh, not necessarily that type of relationship, but you made a point about um, your kids, your children. Um, and that's not something that uh, that we've talked about with the other panelists, whatever. So I kind of want to open this up a little bit um, to you guys that are mothers. Um, how did this, so, so this is in particular to you, Nicole, but um, it's definitely open to everybody else. How did this affect you 
as a mother and do your kids know um, about what has happened to you? As far as me, um, it affected, you know, when me and my brother went through what we went through and me, God giving me three boys, I used to teach them. I taught them a young age. People around me used to think I was crazy, but I taught them about sex early. I taught them about fondling. I taught them about any inappropriate touching. I introduced them to condoms at a early age. It affected me that I put so much of a watch on them that it kind of hindered them in a way that when they broke free, they had to be free. Because I tell them now, I said, man, I, as much as we went through, I raised y'all. But it was because I kept that hole. They said, Ma, you always look at the negative. No, I'm always preparing for the worst. And the worst is, is that these things are happening out there. It made me more visual, more detailed, and more paying attention to every little thing and, and making everybody the usual suspect. So it kind of helped and hurt in the, in the same time. Mm. Uh Katrina, Tiffany, y'all want to touch on the, the mother question here? Um, yeah, I want to touch on it. I, I can agree with Nicole so co-heartedly. It made me protect my kids so much. I have two boys and I'm so protective of them. And um, I went above and beyond to keep my youngest one, which is 28 now. I'm still protective of him. I still have all these barriers that I carry like my youngest child he even told me the other day I kid y'all not he said mom you got to let go I'm grown but I carry that because of me and because I have separation issues because of uh of how I grew up I told you my auntie my uncle raised me so I I, I really I have a problem with anybody doing anything wrong to my children I come to defense with them like this you understand anyone that tries mm -hmm. to do anything to harm them i'm there you understand I, I, it's just that protection is overwhelming and they have to tell me sometimes mommy put your guards down so i i agree with nicole it, it can hurt yes it can be hurtful too and it can be positive but it can be also bad but i, I can't stop it i really can't i'm trying I'm literally trying, but I'm very overprotective of my boys and even my grandchildren. I have a granddaughter that I talk to now and I tell her don't sit on men lap. It's a lot of stuff I tell her about men and she's only 12. So understand this, this takes over our whole life and it makes us look at everything around us and the loved ones like your children, your grandchildren, it makes you be protective like that. So that's, I, I, I agree so much, Nicole, and thank you for saying that. I'm glad that we brought this up because it does give you uh, good times and bad times when it comes to your kids. And we just, we do, we go overboard because we love them so much and want to protect them. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, you want to add? Yes. Um, I, uh, I'm I'm like Trina and Nicole. I'm very, very protective of the twins. Um, I think having a girl has makes my protection of them. I don't want to say I'm not gonna say extreme because I don't believe I'm an extreme parent, but I'm very protective of both of them, but even more of heaven. Um, of my daughter because she's at the age now where I was raped. Um, she's also, they, they've also reached the, the age of when there was someone in my, my, a friend of my family who so would come over who made me very uneasy. Um, they're at the age now where my virginity was taken from me. So I'm like Trina. I don't believe in them sitting on men's laps. Um, I, when I'm talking to uh, victims and going into the shelters, I try to stress to the mothers there in the shelters, do not force your children to hug or be physical with family members just because they're family. If your child doesn't want to hug grandma or uncle, uncle Bob, then don't force them to do it because there's a reason why they don't want to be affectionate 
with these mm -hmm. people. It might not be that they're hurting them or abusing them, but if your child does not want to hug a family member or a friend or doesn't want to, you know, be in within their, you know, their, their space, then respect your child and give them that because there's a reason. There's something about that person that their child is not comfortable hugging them or giving them a kiss on the cheek or something. So I'm, I'm a very big about that too. Um, there was a moment when my daughter told me that she was sore down there and immediately, because she had just come from her father's house, immediately I went on a rampage. Well, who was she around? Where does she go? Does she spend the night at someone's house? My first, my first thought was somebody has hurt my baby. Someone's done something to my baby. Um, and I'm like that still, whenever they're out, when they're not with me, especially when they're with their dad, because he has guy friends, mm -hmm. I know that their father is very protective of them and he would not let them get in a situation for someone to do something with them. But because he has male friends and he's taking the twins with them, I constantly worry about, well, who are they with? Did they spend the night? Why are they spending the night over there? Um, do you know this man? You know, so forth and so on. So I'm very protective when it comes to other men um, being around my daughter and her relationship with, with other men or other boys. I talk to her all the time about, or both of them. I talk to them both very openly about sex because that's something my parents didn't do for me. Um, so yeah, I, I think that being raped at a young age for all of us has made us hyper, super hyper and super, not super hyper, super aware of things. And sometimes probably too much, but just knowing what situations we were in and knowing how things happen to us has made us very aware of our children and where our children are and who our children are with. So, yeah. um, I definitely want to say that I appreciate you all as mothers, especially when it comes down to you guys raising sons. Um, I, I think there's a topic that it needs a little more um, attention um, because you guys are all women and you know, I know I can understand, especially in your case, Tiffany, and you're, you're raising your daughter, and this is like a mini you, and this is that age, and this is that time frame, so everything is like you're on alert. But for for you guys that are raising sons um, and, and really preparing them for the world, about teaching them about this that is going on, and, and making sure that they don't, you know follow that track and, and become that um that's very powerful very inspiring so um definitely shout out to you guys definitely you nicole um especially raising three boys um i grew up in, i'm the middle child so i grew up in a household with the older brother and a younger sister but i followed behind my older brother so uh in a single parent household growing up and, and you know i just had my mom so you know growing up and, and not having my dad there as a, a father and, uh, and a male role model, I'm looking up to my brother at this point. My brother started having sex early. He was 14 when he first started having sex and he just took off after that. And, you know, for the long, you know, it went for a long time, but my mom, she was really uneasy and it was like she kind of blamed herself and the fact that, you know, the, the lack of my dad being around, you know, she happened to try to be the mom and the dad and try to figure out how to raise these young men and, and what to tell them because it's easy you know as a, a woman you know to tell her daughter you know what to do and what not to do but it's it's a totally different process it's really fun and so immediately the worry was what about my middle son you know what I'm saying? My, my oldest son is out here having sex and doing this and that and, and she knows that's my role model I'm looking up to him so she's wondering when it's gonna happen for me so at an early, early age, and I wasn't in a mindset to really understand sex at the time, but she got on me early, you know, she, she bought him condoms, she bought me condoms. I had a drawer full of condoms before I even ever had sex, you know, and it's just, because she, she knows that she can't be there 
24 seven. He's not around when it's just me and my brother kicking it or whatever the case may be. So it's like, you know, let me stay ahead of it. So we had the talks and, and my mom, you know, and, and, and Tiffany knows my mom is very forward. Um, so it wasn't no, oh, oh, you 12, 13 years old, or let's talk about the birds and the bees. No, she was very direct. She, you know, she, on top of what this is, what that is. Um, let me explain to you. We're not watching no videos doing all that. I'm going to tell you so that you don't learn this from somebody else. You need to learn this from me. Even down to my little sister, you know, and, and people were telling her about stuff in school and she would come home and say, mommy, you know, this, this, and this. And my mom's like, no, let me stop you right there. I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going on or whatever. So, you know, you know what we're dealing with here, because now, you know, this is a household. And as a single mom, she's got me and my brother. My brother's having sex. She don't know if I'm having sex now. And my sister's right behind me. So it's like, I need to make sure that all of my kids are straight. You know, so uh, again, you know, I appreciate you guys um, as mothers uh, preparing children for the world that we live in. It's, it's really important. Um, so let me uh, let me get back to, to Nicole. Um, and talking about relationships, um, I also want to touch on just your relationships with people, not necessarily somebody that you're dating or you're married to, or whatever the case may be, but relationships in general. You were talking about you being that person in your family to hold everybody down. You held it down for your brothers and stuff like that. So now, let's fast forward to now. Your brothers appreciate what you did for them, you know, going what you went through and then still being able to hold it down for them to do. How do they feel about it now? Do like, do they appreciate what you've done? Mm, yeah, well, one of my, my brother that I talked about, um, that this happened to, he was murdered a few years back. And, um, when I was going through what I was going through, Again, my later life, my ex-husband, he was the one that took me and my three sons in. And um, he appreciated me because that's why when I left my abusive relationship, he took me and my three sons in, in his one bedroom apartment and to allow me from another state to start my life over. He appreciated of me, he remembered. And there were times that I used to want to protect him. I couldn't, and he used to tell me and he talked to me about it. You know, that's why I'm able to share it. You know, may he rest in peace. And um, so, yeah, you do see the appreciative You know, that everybody realized that I try. There's some people that you're gonna keep doing and doing for that don't appreciate it. And it's not for them to appreciate you because God always, you know, have your back in the end. Right. As long as that you're there to help them. Cause, you know, so. Yeah, I know how tough it can be when you're the person that wears yeah. all the hats. And when you're wearing all the hats and you're spreading yourself so thin, you're doing so much mm -hmm. and, and, and it's it's in you to do that. But mm -hmm. there's always the worry of well, who got me, you know? And, and I mean, not saying that that's what you got to think about, but it's, it's that it's there, you know, like, so it's important about the people that support you, the people that are around you. Um, I mean, but I want to... Uh, I think that the kids is an important thing. So I kind of, I want to go mm -hmm. back to that. Um, so, and this is posed to all of you. Um, and sorry, D, I'm not excluding you. I, um, my kids, D. <laughs> I'm first, but I have kids. Okay. I, I just, I didn't want to be excluded. I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. But um, but this is, this is posed to all of you, you know, with kids. And it doesn't matter what age, um, but... Do your kids know about your struggles and how do they feel about everything that you went through? My kids don't know. My my daughters are nine and eight. I mean, we've had talks with them as far as like like everybody else said about, you know, sex, what to do, what not to do. But as far as telling them my story, no, I do when I when we talk with them, I did say you know, this is something I'm very passionate about and, you know, I take it very seriously. I mean, I really pushed it home, but I never explained why, you know. Okay, so to D, you know, but just before I, I let everybody else, um, do you plan on 
telling them? There's a lot of people that I still haven't even told, let alone my kids. Like I said, I have I have eight siblings. Mm-hmm. And I've only and I said one of them, but I'm correct that I've only told two of my siblings. Um, my father is not aware. Because my father was locked up for 16 years of my life. So I I'm still trying to figure out how to exactly sit him down and tell him about this situation. Um, where I don't leave him feeling any guilt. I'm right. I'm like Nicole, I'm like Nicole, if I can protect the person I can even when it comes to my own situation. Okay, okay. Um, to Katrina, now I know you mm-hmm. guys, uh, your sons are older. So um, do they know and when did they know and how do they support you now? Well, um, of course, yes, my children do know. And I did tell them as they got a little older, um, they, the way that they reacted, they were angry and they were how kids are protective of their mom. You know, I wish I could have protected you, mom. Why didn't you tell me a long time ago? And, you know, they wanted to know all the details of it. So I have told both of my children, but what I am grateful to God about is that my children have taken my situation, especially my oldest son, because he has three kids and he has taken me as an example to show them what not to do yes you understand so my son is just like me he is an advocate to his children and he also talks about it with other people's kids and his friends kids so he has learned from me to be a higher power to empower somebody else and show them the right way to do it and the right way to talk to their kids about sex to anything and to how they um how their children should act around other people and he's even taken up the part as far as when i was raised that when grown people are in a room my kids need to be separated from them and my and he is very my oldest son is very strong and opinionated when it comes to how my granddaughter dress she is to dress as a child needs to dress not as a grown woman would dress and my other son. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. My other son, he um, he's more like me, and he's very sensitive, like me myself. I'm very sensitive, but at the same time, I'm very strong because if God not felt like I needed to still be here, I wouldn't be here. So my younger son takes on that, and he finds it to be a strength because my son went through stuff and I will talk about this at the event due to what I've been through, but my son has learned to overcome it. So now he talks about the positive side of it. And he tells my mom's been through this, any female that he has ever dated, he tells them what I've been through. And it has helped people that he has been in a relationship with, even currently who he's with, she understands because sometimes even when your children reach out and they start their own relationships, those women that they're with, you need to tell them as well and get them to understand you and to know you for who you are and what you represent as well. Okay. Um, Tiffany, now you have, uh, again, the twins, boy and a girl. So, um, and then, of course, the book, uh, and I know that you'll talk more about that later, but um, have you told the kids and how how do they handle it if they are handling it and how do they support you now? Well, unfortunate, well, I'm going to say unfortunately, but fortunately, um, they learned about things that have happened for me by attending speaking engagements with me and being out in the community. So really the same way you you found out a lot of things as my husband. Um, and I think that if they were not at the events when I'm talking, that it probably would have taken me longer to share my story with them because they started hearing my story at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. So at 9, 10, I would have thought they were too young. But because I believe in transparency when I'm doing, you know, when I'm out in the community, they have, they've heard my story out in the community and not necessarily on our couch having a, a conversation about it. Um, so yes, they do know, they, they know what, what I've been through. 
Um, whenever they ask me questions, I give them truthful answers. Um, I talk to them a lot about how, whenever I'm talking to them about things as far as boys and girls and sex and so forth and so on, I always, now that they know, I try to share things that have happened to me so that they avoid certain things for them, um, especially when it comes to not letting anyone touch you inappropriately, um, demanding respect um, for people to be respectful of your body, for you to be respectful of your own body. Um, so yes, they do know. And my son has read my book. Um, so he's even more aware than my daughter of things that I've been through because he has come to me while reading my book and asked me, did mommy, did this happen to you? And I'll tell him, yes, that that actually happened to me. So he knows a little bit more than my daughter and that's because I feel he's the more mature one mm -hmm. right now, but they are very aware um, that I have been a victim of sexual assault. And, yeah. So. And they're very supportive. They're very supportive. They, they understand what they have heard and they understand that the work that we all do in the community is is sharing our story to hopefully help help others. So they understand that. Okay. All right, guys. Well, uh, we are coming up to the uh, end of our time. I want to thank each and every one of you for first, definitely for sharing your stories. Um, I know it can be difficult. I know that can be tough to have to relive some of those moments of your life but they definitely have made you stronger people, made you who you are today. So I definitely want to start by saying I appreciate each and every one of you for sharing, um, you for being a part of this panel today. And I want to let all you the viewers know that this is like the pre-show to the big show. So <laughs> the event is again, June 20th from four to eight in Concord, North Carolina, it is speak up, your voice is power. So again, that's June 20th from four to eight. It's at the Queen City Extreme in Concord, North Carolina. There will be, uh, of course, everybody that spoke today. So your speakers, um, there'll be vendors there, uh, workshops, um, uh, able to get resources and information. Uh, and so it, it should be a really good event. Uh, so I strongly urge everybody to, you know, get your tickets, be there um, and, and take part. Again, I will be there as well. Um, and I, I appreciate everybody. So um, Tiffany, if you would like to add some uh, in comments. Yes, I just wanted to close out by just recapping. Um, the purpose of us doing this is Katrina and I, um, the last time we had a phone conversation, we were talking about what we needed in relationships from the people that we're in, which is in, inspired this platform right here. On June 20th, we're gonna be sharing more about our stories. We're gonna be talking about how we were able to become advocates, um, getting a little bit more detailed about things that have happened to us, um, you know, sharing more, being more transparent. Um, but I felt that it was important for us to have this panel about relationships because as survivors, we have special needs that maybe people who have not been through what we've been through have. Um, and I, so I want to close by sharing what we've said today about what we have needed in our relationships. Because if you, for those who are watching and who will be watching in the future, if you have ever met a survivor of sexual assault or if you've ever dated someone who has been a survivor, or if you meet someone in the future who is a survivor of sexual assault, please understand that we have special needs. And in order for you, in order for us to have a healthy relationship with someone, that there are certain things that we need. And I, I believe that the things that we talked about today with you and I'm here with you today can, can be things that can help anyone in a relationship with a survivor because we all really said a lot of the same things. Um, so I wanted to share 
what some of those things were because it might it's going to be helpful for us and our spouses um i know that d she's married these things that she's told her that she's going to need it doesn't change with your sexuality these are things that all survivors may need from from you if you are in a relationship with us or if you're our family or a friend it's not just intimate relationships it's all the relationships in our lives that these are things that we need. Um, so some of those things were, believe us, when we tell our story to you, we're not, we're telling you because we are trusting you with our story. So please believe us. We're not telling you this story for sympathy. We're not telling you this for you to, to feel sorry for us. We're telling you this because something in us is trusting you with our story. So please believe us when we tell you our story. That's very important. Um, support us. When we're telling you our story, we're trusting you to believe us. We're, we're also hoping that by telling you, you're going to support us, whether it's as our, our spouse, our partner, our, our mother, our aunt, you know, our sons. We, we will need that support. And even when we might not think that we need it, we need your support because we're trusting you with our story. Um, it feels good to feel protected. I know for me, it was very important to know that the person that I chose to be with, that not only did he believe me, but he was not going to let anyone hurt me if he could stop it. So giving us a, a sense of protection, knowing that you understand what we've been through and you're not gonna subject us to that yourself and you won't allow others to subject us to, to this within your power. You know, some things are not within another person's power to protect us from, but if you can protect us, we, we need for you to protect us. Um, also knowing our triggers. I think that's really important. I think everybody um, talked about it. Katrina, you talked about it. Dee, you talked about it. Um, if our spouses, our family, our friends know what our triggers are, then reducing those, those triggers and knowing what our triggers are so that you can support us. Because I could, just like Katrina, she doesn't like being in a crowd of people. She doesn't like being surrounded by men. If you know that that is a trigger for me, then you will try to reduce instances of us being in those triggers. So knowing our triggers is very important as well. Um, be patient. I think all of us mentioned that as well. Be patient because there is gonna come, come times where maybe we're going through something and we're not able to put it in words. I know Dee said it earlier that sometimes she's not able to, she hasn't been able to put in words what she needs. And we talked about this before, when we were putting this together. She was saying, you know what? I'm not really sure what I need, but be patient because we might not know what we need in certain moments. And we might just need you to just sit there and listen. Sometimes we don't need you to respond. So being patient is very important. When, we're, when, when being in a relationship with a survivor. Um, let me go at my own pace is something that uh, Katrina mentioned. Let me go at my own pace. I know we, myself, and I know Dee as well, and Nicole, we all talked about having some sense of control over our sexual needs. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's very important that, you know, us having control. But I think it's really important for us, for me to also say that even though it's, I, that there, even though for a long period of time, I needed to have that sense of control over my sexuality and, and sexual intimacy, but I'm also learning how to be submissive and being submissive to my mate has been very hard for me. But that's because of what I've been through. I've been taken advantage of so many times that it's really hard for me to be, to be submissive. Mm -hmm. But it's also important, especially being married, for me and Dee, 
And also, Nicole, you've been married before. Trina, you've been married before. When a woman or a man, especially a survivor, is able to be submissive with you, then they're trusting you with their body. And when, so, when we as survivors trust you with our body, that means a lot. Please don't hurt us in return. Give us, let us do this at our pace. Let us submit on our own time. Never try to force us to submit to something that we're not ready for. So, um, the other one was to understand me and to be respectful of my space. So understand when I'm talking to you and I'm sharing and I'm trusting you and I'm, I'm needing your support, try to understand where I'm coming from. And if you don't understand, be willing to learn, educate yourself and be willing to understand what we're going through. Because you really don't know what a person has gone through as a survivor unless you've been through it. And we don't wish that on anyone. So if you want to love us and you care about us, whether it's an intimate partner, family or friends, if you don't understand then ask, and if you still don't understand, educate yourself. I've seen books in Cedric's car about depression and about um, loving a, a victim of sexual of, of assault. He's educating himself because he wants to understand. So I think that's very important of our partners as well, as well as our family and friends. And then lastly, and I thought this, this was really a good one from Nicole, is appreciate who I am to you. I thought that that was very important that she said, appreciate who I am to you and who I'm trying to be to you. And don't judge. Do not judge us. Do not see us being survivors as a weakness and something that you can take advantage of because it's not. I think all of us are strong, are strong. We are willing and being transparent. And so please do not be judgmental. So those are some of the things that I wrote down from all of, all of our stories and everything that we've shared tonight. And we hope that us doing this panel for those that are listening and will listen in the future, that we want for people to understand that as survivors, we do have special needs and they will be based on the individual survivor, but all of us shared a lot of these same needs for our relationships. And again, it's not just intimate relationships, it's with our family, our friends, our children as well. So, thank you everybody for watching survivors talk relationships and we hope to see you on June 20th. Um, June 20th is going to be, we're going to have a, a one additional speaker who was not able to join us today. We're going to be talking more about our stories. You're going to be able to ask live questions. You'll be able to give us our hugs and, and just meet us face to face. There's going to be vendors there. There's going to be demonstrations on um, uh, self-defense. It's going to be a very, very, very Enter enter not only entertaining, but ins inspirational and very informative event on June 20th. All of us will be there and we hope to see you guys there too. Thank you for watching and please feel, feel free to share. We, we share our stories to inspire others, but we also share to educate others as well. So thank you everybody for being on the panel. I appreciate all of you and love you all. Thank you. Love you too. <laughs> thank you guys. Have a good day. Love you. You're welcome. Love you, Love you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.